Simon? I mean, I'm only picking on you because you were standing up, right? I mean, that's the... That's the... <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, uh, in some places, there is a tradition, the last person entering the room taking minutes. <laughs> it does... No, we're not going like... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, we have it. Thank you, so Simon. The, like through the data tracker in the note taking oh. thing. Yes, Simon. Cool. I'll help you out. Well, we we had. Well, I tried it once. I just used video audio recording after mm -hmm. to fill them. Was it okay? Did ah. it work? I mean, we have the. I mean, so we have the transcript too. The transcript yeah. Is reasonable now. Okay, let's start. We have a busy agenda. I'm very excited, especially now when we have minutes taker. Hello, everyone. This is Passover Networking Research Group. Welcome. It's been a while since we got so many people in this room and both chairs in the same room. Wow. Yeah. Well. This is Brian. I'm Jen. You, you, you were in London, but yeah. it was a year ago. So this is IRTF note well. It's just Monday, so I'll leave it on the screen for a few seconds so you can read it. Well, I guess you can download slides and read it. So yes, the standard IRTF note well, I don't think it's changed, but please take a look. Housekeeping, standard rules apply. Uh, please ca scan the QR code on the screen or just open on-site tool on your phone from the agenda. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question if you're in the room, even if you're in the room, please join the Meet Echo Q. Uh, Brian and I would appreciate that because it does make our life easy in terms of managing the queue, especially when you have virtual participants and in-room participants. Uh, people on Miteco, uh, please keep your audio and video off unless you're actually speaking. And to speak, I think it's usual, join the queue. And after you are the first in the line, send audio and maybe video. Okay, minutes takers done. So this is an agenda. As you can see, we're mostly talking about sign today with just, I think, one non sign related talk. I, and yeah, and we have any other business. So if you have any other agenda suggestions, you have, have one minute, 20, 37 seconds to come up with that. So we did not meet in San Francisco, but meantime, it does not mean we did nothing. Actually, we got an RFC published. Wow. Yeah, past properties. We, we know everything about past properties now. <laughs> it's well defined. What? It's not picture kucha. It's not funny. <laughs> we do know everything about past properties now. So, and this is the last chair slides. So we go in back to agenda and uh, who's presenting actually? <laughs> Okay. Well done. Then, ah, beautiful. Okay. So, I start. so hello everybody. I, I'm Luis from Telefonica. Uh, I will present you a, a, an initial idea of an API for retrieving uh, energy traffic radio. radio. From, from the network, from a path. And this is a, a work done in collaboration with Cisco. And, and also in the case of Telefonica, it's also framed in, in a, as part of a European project that is focusing on um, uh, energy efficiency topics, which is called CISGreen, the, the project. So uh, next slide, please. So the motivation of, of, this, uh, uh, of this work is to, to find ways of providing visibility of the energy consumption that we could have in a, in a network path. So um, thinking on a scenario where we have the uh, origin and destination, there could be multiple paths for, for serving the, the traffic of a, a given client. 
freedom flow. So the idea would be to determine what is the, the energy that we can uh, allocate somehow to that uh, particular customer or, or, or user, let's say, or in, in general terms, what is the, the energy he consumes in, in a given path. So, um, so there could be this, this possibility of allocating per throughput. I, um, we know we are, no, are knowledgeable of the discussions in the uh, impact list about the, the possibility of allocating uh, energy in terms of uh, throughput or, or bandwidth being consumer or so. So we are following that discussion. But the, the initial idea would be that, not to determine what is the energy that can be allocated to, to one given uh, service, let's say. So with, the, with that, we started to define a very basic API right now. So we, we intend to, to improve that for sure. So it's an initial uh, attempt. So we are using well-known architectures, so RESTful APIs and, and schemas, the Open API schema. And as I said, it's very simple, uh, simplistic by now, but we, we intend to, to, to make it more sophisticated. So we've done it, we, what's done in this uh, way, just simply to show feasibility of, of that uh, kind of APIs. So this information or this API could be consumed either externally. So for instance, we, we uh, put here the, the case of SDN, SD1 customers, because this is the, the origin of the, the initial idea that we had in mind, but also could be done, uh, we could be consumed internally, the thinking on uh, optimization purposes from the operator perspective, if we want to move flows from, or we can consolidate flows, maybe in these cycles of day and night and these kind of things. So also can be consumed by, by other entities in the uh, internal to the operator for doing that kind of optimization. Next, please. So the, the rationale behind this idea of visibility of energy was uh, we, we assumed to, we took two assumptions. The first one is that the, the energy consumption in a device has for sure a baseline uh, component, which is independent of the traffic. So it's due to the processors, to the fans, to the chassis, the cards and, and so on and so far. But there is another component in the energy consumption, which is dependent on the uh, traffic uh, volume, right? So um, we put there a, a reference. The, in this uh, paper, you can see an analysis uh, done in, in that uh, direction. And basically, the, in, in the that paper, in that analysis, there is a, a, a variable consumption of, of uh, energy depending on the, on the volume of the traffic, which is somehow linear. It's, it's modeled in a, as a linear uh, um, uh, graph, let's say. So with, with that, and, and basically uh, from the conclusions of this paper, more or less would be that the 80% is, is, is consumed by the baseline and 20% would be that variable consumption. So being that the case, the, or a second assumption is okay, by now probably we can simply optimize that 20% of the, of the consumption, but maybe in the future, if the devices were able to implement mechanisms for going into a sleep mode or switch off cards or these kind of things, probably we can also go to, to uh, reduce the part of the, that is the current baseline. So if we can switch off a, a processor, if we can switch off a, a card, we can enter some ports in the sleep mode, these kind of things. So this is probably not feasible today, but uh, we expect that could be feasible in the future. Next, please. Mm -hmm. So going uh, uh, to, the, to the point, so essentially what we uh, consider is that we will have some consumer or some consumer of the API that will interact with a network front end. This could be a, a network controller. It could be any other uh, control or management component that could create, let's say, or could leverage on, on this information for create a, a energy consumption map. And the idea would be to retrieve the information of the consumption from the devices, from the different uh, devices that are somehow uh, uh, enabling the, the different paths. Uh, the idea that we have, what we are doing by now, is to, uh, collecting the information from the uh, from the transceivers, so we can, uh, from the region to destination, to determine the consumption of the of the transceivers plus the consumption of the chassis of the of the different uh, the routers in the in the middle. The very basic APIs, as you can see at the bottom on on, on your left. So the query is uh, source uh, IP, destination IP, and the throughput for uh, for the traffic, and the response is the watts per gigabit. If we, uh, the throughput is somehow um, optional, so if you don't include the throughput, you get the, the, overall, the full, let's say, uh, consumption in the path. Next, please. So just for finishing the, the presentation, this is an initial work. The, the idea would be to collect feedback from the, from the research group, sorry for the typo, and, and checking the, the interest, if this could be interesting or not for Partner G. And yeah, we, we are targeting to prepare a new version for ITF 119 with more sophistication and more, more let's say, more stuff, essentially. Thank you. Probably around 20 seconds. Okay.
have you considered the, uh, the energy source as part of your research? Not in, in this APA, but could be something, uh, I mean, what we were considering here would be measurable stuff that you can collect. The, the energy sources would be something like a property. Mm -hmm. So this is also something that is in our minds, but it's not implemented in the API. Probably we will need to check other sources like inventory, information sources like inventory for uh, associating the source, the energy source that is feeding whatever uh, router in the, in the path and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, let's see, Q, we have, um, Ali is in the queue? Yes. Yep, I'm here. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, there's also been uh, work uh, ongoing related to um, uh, carbon aware networking. And uh, there, the question uh, about uh, creating an API towards the energy grid also came up, basically saying that we can collect uh, carbon intensity information from the network, uh, from the grid, and make path decisions according to that. So I understand your API is on the other side, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, would you consider that also a relevant activity? Uh, we need to look at it. Mm -hmm. To be honest, uh, we, it was not in, 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 our, in our plan, let's say, by now, but yeah, for sure we will look at it and uh, yeah, whatever source could be convenient to have, it could be something that could be integrated. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but yeah. we need to look at it. So Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. So this sounds like... This sounds like an excellent discussion for the list. So yeah. that was like the, we're, we're asking for feedback there. Sure. I think that what we've found out today is that, you know, we just celebrated, hey, we know everything about path properties. The energy thing is completely outside of the path properties <laughs> framework. So maybe we don't, uh, but yeah, I think this is, this is, let's take this discussion to the list and move forward from there. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, actually, Corinne is... Yeah. Too? So ah, we just ah, gotta I give know. her the. Okay. So what? Hold on. Where'd you go? Oh, what did I do? Hold on. Open the agenda menu. You... Pass lights control. Boom. Okay. Um, it's it's doing the thing. It's working on it. No. This, I do not understand why we're not actually. So you're. It's asking oh, on your phone. You actually need to. Yeah. No, you actually. So if she's controlling the slides from her phone, she needs her phone. Because she's going to be. You're going to be advancing the slides with your phone. I don't know. Yes. Oh. Or you can let me know if I should. Bring the slides up. Okay, cool. Um, let me here. Take back slides control. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. So why are these not sorted? They were sorted in the. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. it. Yes. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Corinne de Kater of the Sign Association. Uh, I will uh, kick off. Uh, I will kick off uh, uh, a bit longer session about uh, Sign. Uh, I first will uh, tell you a little bit about the Sign control plane and data plane, and then later on we will have some uh, uh, presentations from people who actually work or sell Sign. Um, yes, please go back. So the background, uh, I assume that most of you know uh, what Sign is by now. It is a path-aware <coughs> inter-domain architecture, internet architecture, which focuses on availability, security, and scalability. Next slide, please. Uh, the three main components are the, the data plane, where, where the packet forwarding takes place, control plane, where you have the inter-domain routing and where the paths are uh, discovered, and then the control plane PKI, which uh, takes care of the authentication. Uh, sign uh, here's very shortly the architecture. Uh, 
uh, it's uh, a Cyan architecture consists of isolation domains, uh, which itself uh, is a grouping of ASs. And some of the ASs in an isolation domain are called core ASs, and they more or less take care of the administration of the um, isolation domain. Each isolation domain has its own roots of trust. And it is also, uh, how do you say it? It also um, facilitates uh, routing protocols scalability. Next slide, please. So what, what, what we, did we do since uh, the last IETF in March, where we also had a short presentation at Penergy <coughs> and where we also said what we did until then. Um, so uh, we now have a full stack of drafts about the sign components control plane, PKI, uh, control plane, and data plane. There's also a draft which gives an overview, a bit high level of sign, and there is a draft which gives a uh, component analysis. The control plane PKI draft has been presented and discussed uh, at the Penergy interim meeting a year ago. The control plane draft has been presented at the routing, group, uh, routing area working group uh, last July. And the data plane draft is quite new, so it has not been discussed and presented yet anywhere. We also joined the hackathon last weekend, uh, where we had uh, two small uh, presentations in the end. Uh, one project was that we uh, set up a deployment uh, environment with one ISD and five ASs, and uh, at the same time uh, wrote instructions to this. And then the other, uh, there were small, more uh, experimental, practical projects. Uh, we are at the Hackathon uh, Happy Hour uh, later in the afternoon, so if you want to ask something about these projects, please, you're very welcome. And then I'm very pleased that I can also welcome a Cyan vendor and a Cyan uh, user uh, today. They will uh, have presentations after my presentation, and they tell a little bit about how it is to use Cyan and uh, how it is to implement Cyan, so a bit more about the practice. Because Cyan is not only a theory, but it's really also used today. Next slide, please. So now I want to give you a short introduction to the sign control plane. Uh, next slide. The control plane is about interdomain routing. Uh, it consists of three processes. Uh, one process is the exploration or the beaconing, where uh, the valid paths are discovered, and this happens with so-called uh, beacons. Then ASs select path segments and make them available to other ASs. This is the registration process. And in the resolution process, an endpoint uh, who wants to communicate with another endpoint uh, looks up uh, path segments and combines them into an end-to-end uh, -end path, which is added to the packet header. The first two processes, sorry are uh, uh, performed by the control services, uh, which each AS has an assigned control service. And this is one of the, this is the main infrastructure element uh, of SIGN. And then the resolution, the lookup uh, of path segments, and also combining them in an end-to-end -end pass is uh, done by the endpoint itself. Now you can. So a little bit more about the path exploration. Uh, how does it happen? Uh, it happens by core ASs who peri periodically send uh, path construction beacons uh, yeah, away. Uh, on their way, uh, you, we have this inter-ISD core uh, beaconing, which is between uh, core ASs, uh, and this uh, beaconing helps to find valid paths between core ASs, both within one uh, ISD and also between different <coughs> ISDs. And then there is also the intra-ISD beaconing, uh, where a core AS uh, sends beacons uh, uh, top-down to its child ASs, and their pass, passes, valid passes between core and child ASs are uh, discovered within one ISD. Uh, per propagation period, each AS also propagates the beacons it received to other, to its neighboring uh, a ASs. And um, these PCBs accumulate the cryptographic uh, information about uh, crypt cryptographically protected information about paths and forwarding. And this is more or less the key content of one uh, PCB, as it includes an initiation timestamp, expiration time, so ID, the list of all the ASs with it, it passed so far on the path. Uh, this uh, routing information is signed. And uh, there is also an announcement of possible peering links. So this graphic shows us a little bit the process in a very simple way. 
uh, you see on top the core A assets A and B in these uh, ISD, and there uh, the PCB starts uh, is sent away uh, down like uh, from A to C to F. On its way, it accumulates information about the ACs, uh, the ASs it passes. Next slide, please. And the pass registration is then where uh, each AS uh, selects uh, part of beacons uh, and then regi registers them as path segments. And it can either be an up pass or a down path segment. Each uh, AS is free to uh, use the selection criteria and algorithm it thinks suits uh, this AS best. And it is the beacon is happens top down, but uh, path seg segments can also be traversed uh, uh, bottom up. So this uh, reversion of path segment is possible. Op segments uh, uh, are those segments that uh, this is the way an AS wants to reach its own core AS. Down path segments are a segment which uh, is the way ASs want to be reached by other ASs. Uh, up path segments are stored at uh, the ASs own control service. And the uh, down path segments are uh, registered at the uh, control services of the core AS, which is connected with the uh, specific AS. So you also can see this on the, in the graphic. Uh, this uh, ASF, it uh, stores at its own control service the path segment FCA. It's an op path segment. And this is how it wants to communicate with the, it, the core AS it is uh, connected to. Uh, but it registers the down path segment ADF at the control service of the core AS because this is uh, the path it wants to, how it wants to be reached by other ASs. Next slide, please. And the path resolution is then where uh, an endpoint who wants to commun communicate with another endpoint uh, uh, looks up path segments and then combines them in an end-to-end -end path. Uh, the looking up uh, takes place in the control plane, the combining of path segments in an end-to-end -end pass, and then putting this uh, pass information in the pass of the, at the header of a packet. This happens in the data plane. Uh, usually, the combination of a pass to an end-to-end -end pass uh, requires up to three uh, path segments, an up path segment, a core path segment, and a down path segment. So the op-pass segment is to connect with uh, the own core AS. The core segment is uh, if the destination AS does not share a core AS with the source AS, and then you have you need a core segment to com communicate with this other core AS. And the down-pass segment is to reach the uh, destination AS from the core, down from the core. Um, so this is also, you can see this again in the graphic. Uh, this endpoint in ASF wants to communicate with endpoint in ASH. It needs, for this, it needs an op path segment FCA to its own core AS. Then it needs a core uh, segment uh, from the core ASA to core ASB. And then there is, it needs a uh, down path segment from B, E, H to, to communicate with uh, endpoint, destination endpoint H. And uh, it is, uh, how do you say, it is um, uh, to reduce latency, uh, uh, it's endpoints should cache uh, return path segments, and they also should send these requests for path segments in parallel. So, so this uh, looking up for path segments happens in the control plane. Now the combining them to end-to-end -end paths happens in the data plane. And the next slide, please. So here is an overview slide of the data plane. Uh, the data plane is where Cyan uh, forwards these uh, packets between interdomain packets between ASs. And as now might be clear, it is based on end-to-end -end pass information, which is contained in the packet header. This pass information consists of a sequence of hop fields, one hop field per AS, which is uh, part of the pass. Each hop field uh, contains ingress and egress uh, interface ID for uh, the corresponding AS. And these hop fields are um, authenticated with the so-called message authentication code to prevent forgery. Uh, AS has used their own secret key to authenticate these hop fields. And these, hop, these MEC must be checked by the border route, the sign routers uh, on the way. And they should only forward uh, packages package which are um, explicitly authenticated 
And so this also the graphic shows this a little bit. The border routers of the sign routers are on the edge of ASs. And they so what they have to do during the forwarding is just to access access the next hop in the uh, packet header, verify verify the authenticity of the Mac, and then if everything is okay, just forward the package. So there is no need anymore for or no longer need for uh, inspect the destination addresses and forwarding tables and so on. And here you also see a very compact uh, uh, illustration of a sign packet. Uh, each sign packet, the sign header in the packet, uh, the packet header consists of a meta header, which gives some general information about the sign path. Then uh, info fields, which give information about the different path segments. And then hop fields, which is where is hop field represents a, a, one AS on the pass. And also maybe interesting to, uh, to, to show or to tell you is that the intra-domain routing within an AS is just is based on existing mechanisms. So there you do not have to change anything if you want to use sign. Uh, here is a bit more in detail the sign header specification. Um, it, the sign packet header consists of a common header address header, path header, and optionally uh, extension headers. The common header defines the, the entire length of the header and the payload. It also defines the type of sign pass. Uh, currently, we have three types, and most, uh, most important is just the standard sign pass. And then it also defines the type and the length of the endpoint address of both the source and the destination. Uh, the, and the, the address header then defines these addresses in more detail. The path header is then which contains the really the full AS level forwarding pass, and that is where we want to have a, a little bit a look, a little bit more detailed look into. So that's the next slide. So this is the overview of this path header, and this consists, as I already mentioned, one path meta header, which indicates the currently valid uh, path segment info field and also the currently valid uh, hop field so that uh, the router knows where we are currently on the, on the way through the internet. And then it also defines the number of hop fields per segment. Then there are three, up to three info fields. Uh, this number depends on how many path segments were needed to, uh, to combine this path. And this info field contains basic information about the path segment. Uh, there are up to 64 hop fields where each hop Hop field represents an AS uh, to the path, and which are, as I already said, authenticated with this MAC. The next slide, please. So, how is such a uh, path uh, constructed? Um, as, I, as I already told, uh, endpoint in ASF wants to communi communicate with an endpoint in ASH. It first looks up these path segments. You can see that in the, um, uh, the, the left uh, illustration. Here are these path segments also a little bit more in detail, up segment, core segment, down segment. And it then just uh, it's, it extracts this combination, the info fields from these uh, segments, and then the hop fields from these segments. Attract, uh, the endpoint extracts this from these uh, path segments and puts this information uh, in the header of the package. Uh, there are, this slide shows you the possible uh, path segment combinations. So uh, there uh, you have the combination where the communication cr uh, goes through the core ASs of uh, ISDs. Uh, you need two core, uh, you need a core segment if the destination and the source uh, AS do not share a, a, a core. Uh, this is shown by the upper illustrations, the upper graphics. If the source and destination do share uh, a core AS, you have you only need you do not need a core segment, but just an up and down segment. And this you can see in the illustrations on the left. Then sometimes it is possible uh, to to use a pairing link. You see this in the uh, number three of the uh, illustrations. And then sometimes also when they share, uh, they both share an, an AS uh, on a higher level. Uh, you can make a shortcut. And it's even possible, of course, that they are both on the same path. The next slide. So what do we think are the advantages of this uh, sign design choice? Uh, first, it gives uh, control and transparency over the forwarding paths to the endpoints. It also offers interdomain multipaths. It also enables path authorization 
and it simplifies uh, packet processing at the routers because they just have to access the next hop in the packet header hop field and there is no no need for longest prefix matching on ip addresses anymore and uh, what is uh, also important is that you can just reuse the intra domain routing protocols and infrastructure uh, of course, Cyan was uh, designed with security in mind, so uh, uh, there also are a couple of security considerations uh, summarized on this uh, slide. First is the PCBs. They are signed in an onion fashion in order to avoid pass hijacking and splicing. So every AS uh, on the road can verify these rout routing messages by following the static chain. This, this is in the control plane. Then you have this hop by hop pass authorization based on this MAC, which is uh, used in the data plane. Uh, the, as I already said, the router should check these MACs by doing forwarding and only forward the, uh, the packages with uh, verified authorized MACs, MACs. And then uh, the roots of trust in SIGN are ISD scoped. So there is, it is very, there's almost uh, no global kill switch possible in a way, because if one ISD is compromised, then the others can still function. Uh, if you want to read a bit, more, a bit more about the details of all these three technologies, you can either read the Cyan PKI draft or the Bose data control plane draft and the data plane draft, where these things are explained in more detail. Um, uh, the security consideration section in the drafts, they, I, we still have to, to write them. I mean, the content is there, but it's not yet uh, totally uh, written out. So in summary, SIGN is a next generation uh, infra, um, internet architecture with already a productive deployment. The control plane PKI uh, builds the basis for this unique trust model. The control plane provides passware into domain routing. The data plane forwards the data packets based on this end-to-end -end pass information in the pass header, packet header. There are uh, internet drafts available uh, describing all these components. And uh, we are really very interested in your feedback. So please read these drafts and give us feedback. And as I said, the Jana and security consideration section, we still have to write them out. And then the next steps, uh, we hope to discuss this uh, at the end of this session. And then, yeah, we hope we, we get some uh, clarity about how we can continue, especially within the IETF. So that was it, my part. Thank you very much. Maybe there are questions now. Yeah. If there are clarification questions, I think for the, the discussion, we want to hold that for later until we've seen all of the, um, yeah. So Doug Montgomery. Do you envision isolation domains to be roughly proportional to maybe the number of tier ones today, the number of ASs? Rough and and can that concept be recursive? Can there be isolation domains inside of isolation domains? The last thing I, I think is not is that possible? No, but uh, the so the the size of an isolation domain isolation domains are usually how do you say that? Uh, uh, um, how can I say that they are built? It's a logical. It should be a logical. Um, have a logical boundary, like uh, maybe a nationality or a, 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 how do you call this, a vertical industry? Um, how do you call this? Um, cooperation. Cooperation. So, or like in Switzerland, we have this uh, SIAN, secure, secure SI, uh, SSFN. SSFN, yes, which is the finance sector. So this is also like a logical uh, combination of uh, ASs. Combined in one ISV. I somehow disappeared from the queue. Uh, you're, but you're, you're there, and you're, you were in queue, so go ahead. Okay, I was in the queue, right? I wasn't you're dreaming. In the game. I saw it. Yeah, I saw perfect. It. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so Eric Vink, um, Cisco here. The Mac is possibly used with um, a shared secret to authenticate in the data plane, right? So this shared secret, is it by isolation domain or is it by the complete scion? Or I see the gentleman saying, no, oh, no. <laughs> so you know the answer, I guess. Yeah, let's maybe, please answer. Nicola, the other uh, draft author. 
Um, so the secret is per AS. So each AS has its own secret that is used for this uh, message authentication codes. And this AS wide. OK. And how can you exchange then the shared secret among the AS? Is it a need for doing this? This is not shared because the AS is using these secrets to, uh, to authenticate the messages when it does the route discovery process in the control plane. And then the same Mac is in the data plane, in, in the packet header. So then when the AS sees the packet again, it can say, OK, did I create it myself? If the Mac matches, yes. If not, uh, it's somebody else. Uh, it's okay, like a forged packet. Not sure I understood, but it's OK. Thank you. Well, maybe we can take it offline. Or, yeah. And actually, if you can go jump in the notes and put that, or help Simon out with the answer. Notes. Yeah. Yeah. Roland. Uh, Roland Bless, KIT. Um, I was wondering on, on slide seven, you mentioned timestamps for the PCBs. What kind of requirements for time synchronization protocols do you have? So does it need to be some common time inside an isolation domain or between them? Or, I mean, you could have there some circular dependency once you roll out or assign only deployments. So um, as far as I remember, the time synchronization requirement is relatively loose. So it is uh, not in the range of it's in the range, I, I think it's minutes or something, or I, but uh, yeah, 10, Ten seconds. seconds. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. It's, uh, uh, I have a question for the core AS. So, are they uh, interconnected? Excuse with... me, uh, who are you? Okay. So, you are not. <laughs> okay. So, this is Trina from Huawei. So, I have a question from uh, for the core AS. Are they connected with each other directly, or you you allowed to have uh, multiple cores to connect connect by multi hop? What what do you mean? What do you mean with multi hop? So because uh, in the figures when you shoot the core AS, they are always connected directly. So I mean that in your uh, design, do you allow the uh, several uh, core AS uh, interconnect with each other by multi hop? Yes. So is there any issues if you have many core ASs because you will see that you will use uh, flood uh, information of the PCB between the core ASs? Um, so in principle, core ASs are not meant uh, to be a, like a, a huge amount within an ISD. And that's why the, the routing process is really split into this uh, core and core to leave uh, process. Um, I think in existing deployments, usually there's a handful of core ASs in, in an ISD. Okay. Um, so, so this has um, not, really, not been really a problem. OK. So in the future, are you expect to, to study it problem if you have more more uh, huge number of uh, core ASs, or you think it's already sufficient? Um, I think that is, uh, that is a good question. But I think in terms of uh, architecture, it is just not meant to have like, I don't know, uh, tens of thousands of core ESs in a single ISD. But I, uh, I think there has been some work done on scalability, but I, I don't remember exactly on, on, on this, on the number of core ESs per ISD. So I would need to take it offline to, uh, to check. Okay. But okay. that's not really the idea to have like a huge set of core ESs within a single ISD. OK, thank you. <clears throat> David. Uh, hello, David Venner here. I had a question regarding the routing uh, stuff. Um, the, the, the routes that uh, clients encode in the path they want, uh, you get these hop fragments that are signed. But how does how do the uh, in, inter uh, how is it guaranteed to the intermediate ASs that they're not being misused on a path like that, so that somebody did not just take a hop fragment from a random path uh, and just insert it in, in there because it made a convenient path for the endpoints, but maybe the intermediate AS doesn't want to support that in convenient path. So um, the idea is that this, uh, this max are uh, chained. So at each AS, uh, what is max is also the incoming and outgoing interface. So for this kind of path splicing to happen, you would need to have a series of 
polluting ASs, which uh, I think is the only edge case. So if you have like, I think uh, two uh, neighbor uh, or two or three neighbor colluding ASs, then they could have the pa pa packet to take a detour. But if not, a single AS cannot, uh, cannot add uh, an intermediate segment because the next one would see, ah, the previous uh, incoming interface is wrong and then the packet will be discarded. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, this is Vladimir, uh, kind of an off the wall question. I'm listening to it and I'm seeing cryptography which is time-based. I also heard something about 10 second tolerance. So my question is whether you considered networks with fuzzy time domain, such as space networks, and what will we do about that in the future, if anything? That is a good question. I don't think space use case with this super high delay was considered, uh, to be honest. So I think we would need to explore that. But the idea is that you need loose time synchronization. So I bet I, yeah, I would have to think a bit about how loose this could be. <laughs> yes, definitely. Depends on how space, but most Depends space. on space, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so Elliot, you're in a locked queue, but we have time, so go ahead. Ah, that's what that means. Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, just a, a one question. Do you have a, a, any a concept or um, do you envision any concept for proof that the correct path was taken? There is an extension on proof of transit, uh, but this is implemented as, a, uh, as an extension in the data plane. So then this uh, at forwarding HIS adds uh, uh, per hop uh, AS specific uh, additional MAC, uh, but this is an extension, it is experimental, but we will talk about it tomorrow. There is a past validation site meeting, um, right. but that's an extension. So if you look at what is in this draft, then this is not giving you proof of transit to right. verify that, that the, path, the, path, the path has been effectively uh, taken, but it can be added. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much. You. Next up, I th think is, wait, oh, we switched. So it's you now. Okay, cool. Um, do you want to, okay, cool. Even better. <laughs> the internet, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is Sam. Um, I'm from Alapaya, one of the tech vendors of the Cyan. Um, yeah, close to the mic, yeah. you can, Sorry, yeah. No, is that better now? Yeah, okay. I think so. Um, I'm representing Alapaya here, uh, which is a tech vendor uh, of Cyan equipment. And I want to talk a bit more about the operational aspects of Cyan, now that you've heard uh, a lot about theory how it's being used, and now I lost, of course. Okay. Maybe you have to. Yeah, okay, I'll shut. <laughs> um, hold on, I have to. So you're up top now already. Um, my scrolling thing does not look good. <laughs> I can request again. Yes. And yeah. All right. Okay. So I will talk a bit about um, the sign internet ecosystem, how it looks uh, in practice, um, some of the more operational aspects, like bootstrapping a, a new sign isolation domain. You have heard 
about the theoretical concept of an isolation domain before, but how do you do this in practice? Um, how you become a sign AS? Um, then I will talk about IP and sign tunneling, which is uh, an import currently a very important um, uh, application to actually interoperate IP networks and sign networks. Um, and then I will finish off a bit with uh, showing you what use cases are in productive use today. So you get an idea of um, what current customers see as added value in, in sign. Um, and then I also, of course, want to make a bit the point why we are looking uh, long-term for, for standardization and why we're here today. Next slide. Right, uh, the sign internet ecosystem is not surprisingly, looks like an internet, right? You have on the one hand, the sign backbone. And the sign backbone is a community of network service providers that deploy sign routers, basically. Um, think of these sign routers as kind of waypoints on sign end to end paths. Um, and you join the sign internet by deploying these sign routers and pairing them with other sign routers. That's, that's what you need to do, basically. Then these isolation domains, they're really a logical layer um, that are put over this backbone network. So a subset of these um, sign backbone networks will be part of one isolation domain or the other isolation domain, or even part of multiple isolation domains at the same time. Then you have the, the network edge. These are really the users of the sign um, network. Um, there today, we have the sign IP gateways because there are not that many sign native applications, of course, outside of, of, of research. Um, but in practice, everything that uses a sign network goes through such a sign IP gateway. I come, I come to that a bit more. Um, they come in different flavors. Um, they can be physical on-prem network appliances. They can be virtual routers in the cloud, or they can also be um, take the form of a carrier grade sign IP gateway where basically an ISP runs a distributed um, sign IP gateway for its, uh, for example, residential customers, right? And then these sign IP gateways, they're the ones that get the paths from the network, choose the paths based on whatever policy you give them, um, meaning you can do things like geofencing, take only paths that never leave the European Union, for example, or of course, they also have a notion of what network performance you get on a path, and then they can um, optimize for different network performances. Next slide. Um, so isolation domains, we have heard it before. Sign is actually logically a network of interconnected isolation domains, right? Each isolation domain has a core, which are these core ASs. And to come to that question from before, um, core S's are roughly the tier one providers in an area. So not the global tier one providers in the internet today, um, but to give you an example in Switzerland, the three major Swiss ISPs or for, form the core of the Swiss isolation domain. Um, and it would work similarly for other regions as well. Um, each isolation domain, it defines, or it is defined by this trust rule configuration. I'll come to that. if you want to create an isolation domain, this is basically the, the thing you do. You create a new trust rule configuration. And in it, um, you have things like uh, the policy, who is a core AS in that isolation domain, and who are also the root certificates for the entire PKI, because an isolation domain defines a root of trust. Um, importantly, each um, AS, each signed AS, whether it's a core AS or an ordinary um, signed AS, needs assign AS certificate per isolation domain. Um, it can be part of multiple isolation domains, but per isolation domain, an AS needs an AS certificate. Um, and thus the certificate authorities of an isolation domain kind of have a form of access control who can be part of an isolation domain and who cannot. Um, and maybe also to the previous question, we envision roughly one isolation per, uh, domain per country, per geographical region. Um, and then a whole lot of special purpose isolation domains. So think a little bit like top level domains in, in DNS, the country specific ones, those would be kind of the default isolation domains. And then there will be um, a range of uh, industry uh, specific ones or purpose for different purposes. Um, and we'll see two examples later. 
Next slide. So how do you bootstrap then an isolation domain? You need to define a governance. You need to define who is the voting members. So the voting members are the ones that sign that TRC. Um, who are the certificate authorities? Because those uh, root certificates need to be part of the TRC. And who are the core assets? Then you need to get an ISD ID ISO, uh, allocated. Um, currently, Anapaya is assigning ISD IDs. We don't want to do that. Um, but there needs to be somebody that takes that over. Also, reason why we're here. Um, and then you create a trustful configuration. You meet in a signing ceremony, you exchange your uh, public keys, you sign a TRC, and off you go. This is what others need to install in their trust base to trust your isolation domain. So it definitely has some overhead operating in isolation domain. And depending on use case, you need, you need to consider whether this overhead is actually warranted or not. Then assign S in practice, what does it, what does it contain? Um, mostly signed routers, which implement the sign control and data plane that we have heard before. Signed routers today are run on standard off the shelf hardware. Um, reason for that is because we don't have a big tech vendor that creates custom silicon for it. Um, but we actually also don't necessarily need that because forwarding in sign is not long as prefix matching, matching that needs TCAM but it's actually this MEC computation, right? Which is an AS computation, which is actually hardware accelerated on all commodity platforms nowadays. Um, and then optionally, Assign AS can deploy design IP gateways such that IP only end hosts or IP only applications can still make use of this, um, of sign, of a sign network. Um, and crucially, all of these infrastructure components, they are, put on top of an existing IP backbone, right? So sign packets use an IP underlay to, to forward or to communicate between the different sign routers or um, sign nodes. And this was a very deliberate decision that we can reuse as much of the existing infrastructure, which is IP based obviously um, as possible. Next slide. So how do we become such a sign AS? Well, you need to install sign routers again, you can uh, get them as physical appliances, um, commodity servers, basically, or virtual routers. Um, you would deploy them at the borders of your network, right? Mm -hmm. Because you will later then peer with other sign routers of other ASs. Internally, these sign routers are connected via your existing IP underlay network. Then you need to get a sign AS number and a sign AS certificate. Now the AS number, again, Anapaya is currently doing the numbering. We don't want to do that. Um, it's important to say, to mention at this point that sign ASNs are different from BGP ASNs, right? Those are two different namespaces. Our current num numbering practice, however, is that we kind of reserve the entire BGP ASN space. And if you already have a BGP AS number and you would like to join the sign space, then we would give you the same AS number that you already have but doesn't need to be. And again, we don't want to be the numbering authority. It's just currently the only, uh, we're the only ones that, that can do it. Um, sign AS certificate, one per ISD that they want to be part of. If you want to be part of multiple ones, for example, um, a country specific one and, and, and the banking specific one, you will need to get an AS certificate from both. Once you have that, you can then set up your sign peerings. Um, that, of course, then depends on the business relationship. So with other network service providers that are um, equal on the hierarchy, you will, you will set up peerings, uh, core peerings or sign peering links. Um, and otherwise, you set up parent-child relationships, whether it's through your um, downstream customers or upstream service providers. Um, optionally, you can then also install sign IP gateways. Again, if you want to. Um, provide means for your IP only hosts to reach the sign network, you want to do that. Um, if you're purely a sign transit provider, you don't necessarily, necessarily need that. Right, so I've talked uh, quite a bit or I mentioned quite a bit this um, sign IP gateway, this IP in sign tunneling. Um, currently, this is how 99% uh, of sign traffic is is being consumed today. It's IP tunneled in sign traffic, at least on the productive um, sign network. Um, IP in sign tunneling is, is very standard. 
as you can uh, imagine, you're all network professionals here. You take an IP packet, you encapsulate it in a sign packet, you send it through the sign network, and on the other end, it gets decapsulated. And for the hosts um, involved in this data transfer, it's actually completely transparent that they're using a, a sign network. I still want to work you through a very brief example of IP and sign tunneling. So here you have two ASs that want to communicate with each other, 64.101 and 64.102. 64 is the ISD identifier in this case, and 101 is um, a notation for a sign AS number. Um, and we have these two end hosts, dot 100 in these subnets that want to communicate by the sign network. They don't speak sign, of course. That's the setup. Next slide. Um, first, we will have the sign IP gateway that basically through um, a routing protocol here finds um, that the 196192.168.2 uh, slash 24 is actually in this AS64102, right? Um, I don't want to go into details how this works, but it has this routing table. Um, and it, it announces that, for example, via BGP into the internal network, can also be static routing, can be any kind of internal routing protocol. Um, but that's how the end host or the end host packet that has as a destination the 2.100 will get into the sign IP gateway. Um, yeah, next slide. Sign IP gateway looks at the destination address, has internally this routing tables. Is okay, my destination network belongs to AS64102. And then it has this different, two different uh, traffic policies, one for priority traffic that in this example is just the DSCP marking uh, 0x2e um, and one for everything else um, that has a packet path policy, avoid one AS or avoid the other AS. I mean, it's completely made up, but you get, you get the idea. Um, so it will match this one. It will see that this packet that was sent out actually has this uh, priority marking. So it will be part of this priority traffic class. So it will use the path policy avoiding uh, AS103. Next slide. Um, and of course, while doing that, it, it, it has a picture of the network. It does path monitoring to the destination network. Um, you will see here we have four different paths that, that potentially to our destination network. The, the, one, the lowest one has an outage. And from our path policy, we also know that we should avoid the one that goes via 103. Um, so in the end, if you go to the next slide, what's, what's left are the two paths in the middle. And there, it will now use the lowest latency one. Um, and that's the one that is being chosen to send the packet. Um, Yes, and then it goes into the destination, sign IP gateway gets encapsulated, and the end host then reaches the original IP packet. Um, should be pretty standard, but I just wanted to walk you through how this, this is done in practice. Right, if we now come to some of the use cases that are being in production today, these are not the, one, the only ones for sign, but these are the ones that have been um, early adopted. Um, one use case is this multi-provider, multi-organization ecosystem. So you have an, an industry ecosystem. In this case, we have the Swiss banking, Swiss finance industry, and my uh, colleague Fritz will tell you uh, a whole lot more about it. Um, it's basically an ecosystem of 300 finance institutions. You have a backbone network provided by four different ISPs. Um, it is a separate isolation domain. So actually the governance over this isolation domain lies with the Swiss national bank and six, our financial service infrastructure provider and switch as a neutral carrier third party uh, in this voting gremium. Um, and it's, if you so wish, it's kind of a federated multi uh, provider MPLS like um, <coughs> setup here. Um, benefits are high availability and resilience because it's multi provider, right? Multi provider backbone. And we have this instant path failover capabilities of sign. Um, there is this flexibility aspect. You only hook up to this network once and you can communicate with everybody else. You don't set up point to point directions, uh, connections. And there's a, a lot of control, of course, for the, for the members, um, how they want to use that network. But then also there's this form of access control to the ISD by the ISD governance. So that's one use case. And there are two examples 
currently productive in Swiss finance and the Swiss healthcare system. Um, and it's basically the same thing. Um, next slide. This is the second use case that is today being um, used on sign networks. And this is more about um, moving, let's say, not global services that don't need global exposure off the internet into the sign internet. Um, because in the sign internet, you can control a, well, it's not, let's say it's not reachable from the public internet. So that gives you a lot of uh, attack surface reduction because the sign internet is still small. Um, that's one thing, but even if the sign internet would be very big um, on the receiver end, on the destination end, you can determine who should get your path information and who should not get your path information. So you can also control from which networks you want to be reachable. So if you have a service that is geographically limited by nature, you can actually use that on the network level to limit access on the network to your service, right? And this is not a firewall that then block filters based on geo-blocking. This is really, I don't have path information. So for me, this service does not exist on the map. So this is another use case that is today being used um, in practice. Um, maybe a few numbers to give you an idea of what, how big design production deployment is today. There are a total of seven isolation domains, four geographical ones and three industry specific ones. So that would be a, a banking isolation domain, one for the healthcare, Swiss healthcare industry, and then a global um, research and education network isolation domain. Um, there are 106 sign ASs, 11 of which are um, networks of, or ASs of network, network service providers. Um, we have one internet exchange point, the Swiss IX, who is offering a dedicated sign peering mesh. Um, in Switzerland, we have roughly 100% sign coverage. That is A5 ISPs that offer sign accesses but then also through their carrier grade sign IP gateways, basically every end host in Switzerland can reach something within the sign internet. Um, the global reach of sign is unfortunately still very limited, um, but it's also growing. So we have pops of international ISPs in the UK in France, Germany, in Luxembourg, the US East and West Coast, Singapore, Hong Kong, and South Korea. Um, that's about the reach, yeah. And I want to just close out my presentation why we, uh, as the sign community, we think long-term we need standardization. So A, we have the sign ecosystem. It's small, but it is growing, right? And there are a lot of questions being asked. Um, there are interoperability concerns and so on. And I think standardization would even further support the growth of this ecosystem and, and the acceptance of the technology. Um, we have sign is that is being used for mission critical deployment. So we do, um, for example, um, Swiss interbank clearing, which is the most critical application in the Swiss fine system over a sign network. Um, and of course the users of that network, they're asking for, okay, what's the long-term um, future of sign? And part of that is definitely also standardization. We need more independent implementations. There is this open source implementation, and then there is an Anapaya implementation that builds on top of the open source implementation. There needs to be more of that. It cannot just be one commercial and one open source. Um, also, we need to go to the native, uh, bring sign natively to the end hosts, right? That we can move away from IP and sign tunneling. Um, an important aspect is definitely also that sign needs to be interoperable with the existing infrastructure. That is IP and sign tunneling today. That is also, you know, we can redistribute prefixes we, we learn in the sign network via BGP to the internet and vice versa. So there is this interoperability layer, um, but this needs to be formalized. Um, and there are probably many more points that you know better than I do uh, why we need this. Um, and that ultimately also why, why we're here. Cool. Thank Sorry you very for much. Taking a bit longer. Yeah, we have. Uh, if, Michael, if you have a um, clarifying question, come on up, or are you remote? Hold on. Ah, there. Hi. Yes, Michael Holliman, uh, VeriSign. Um, great presentation. I think I'll talk to you at the Hackathon happy hour about more information. But one question I had is, uh, how does the MTU affect um, with the overlay network on the client traffic? 
Is it, does that change? Is it variable with the number of paths that you actually take with Scion? Yes, that, that very good question. It is definitely, um, it is variable depending on the length of the path, right? Um, you have, the MQ gets larger or smaller. Um, the nice thing is that this information is encoded in the sign path. So you know exactly what MQ you can uh, use on that path. Assuming every participant on the path is of course uh, configuring that correctly. So you know upfront what MQ you have without doing path MQ discovery. But if you switch to a different path that is now longer, then the MQ gets smaller, right? And, and the application stack needs to be able to cope with that. Uh, sorry, we closed the queue. If you could come back at the discussion, we want to have like more time at the end for discussion. So thank you very much. Did we say it was the one with SSFN or not? I forget now. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. Is that your last slide? This is it's your current. Oh, no, no it's, it's not the one. Okay. okay. Yep. Good. So hi everyone, I'm Fritz from SIX and uh, just give me a, 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 let me word a precaution about this slide deck. It's a bit more company flavored than probably usual IETF, IERTF slide decks are. But then again, it's a use case. So I want to present you on what we did, what work we did on the Secure Swiss Finance Network, that's the SSFN we've been hearing about in the former previous presentations. Next slide, please. So to give you a bit of context who we are at SIX, so we are the uh, Swiss financial industry <coughs> infrastructure provider. We're owned by the banks and tasked to operate a few um, really important things for the Swiss financial market and of course also beyond. So we are actually the uh, Swiss host, the Swiss stock exchange. So we do listing and trading services. We, will, we do provide financial information, data, such as reference and market data out to our customers. We provide security services, so we act as the central security depository for both physical and uh, you know, virtual uh, securities. So we, we have a large vault we're called, called the uh, Swiss Fort Knox, if you wish, to actually host and store these uh, securities. We also act as central counterparty to facilitate uh, easy um, uh, trading of the securities, and we also act for clearing and settlement of these uh, securities. Then we also offer a, a number of services to banks, namely the uh, billing and payment services, ATM services, debit and mobile services. And part of this is actually the interbank clearing that Sam was talking about. The interbank clearing service is actually transferring the money between the banks it's uh, clearing somewhat in excess of 150 to 200 billion Swiss francs a day, which is roughly maybe uh, about same, same size uh, ecosystem in, in euros or US dollars. We maintain the uh, connections to other banks, Pan Europe and in other markets globally. So meaning there is a network currently supporting the whole operations of our company, not uh, operated by us, but operated on behalf of us, so a semi-private network interconnecting all these parties. Next slide. So we face the challenge of actually creating a new network for these uh, interbank, um, you know, message exchange. Why? We have some, we see on one hand some trends and challenges, and then we see some requirements which came up lately, which weren't met by the current implementation of the network. So the trends and challenges you see, see that the real-time system, such as uh, this interbank payment uh, clearing system, and they, they are uh, moving away sort of from these private, strictly private networks to other networks too, because they want to deploy some stuff in cloud. They want to become more flexible. There's neo banks which exclusively have their, um, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem operated not on their own premises. So there's more and more going on to more flexible networks. But increasing reliance on public networks, let's say the internet is really not, uh, with, doesn't come without any risks. And therefore 
we see that although banks and, and uh, their branches are actually moving towards internet-based communication, think about e-banking systems, think about interactions with customers, um, they actually like to preserve their, let's say, core bank traffic to non-public networks. The vulnerability of data in transport, so on the, the way from source to destination, is at risk. You know this from the uh, vulnerabilities that we see in other routing protocols or in other means of getting data from A to B. And the uh, current solutions to address these risks are inflexible and costly. Think about private networks, point-to-point -point networks, MPLS networks, which you need to build for multi-party. It's always a bit of a challenge who owns the network and who operates it. So we had some requirements for that new interbank network, which weren't met with the current solutions. The current solution is roughly 20 years old, split MPLS um, carrier-based offerings. So we wanted to see a secure and resilient communication networks for uh, just as these use cases, payments, other um, critical infrastructures. We wanted to be resilient also to, to uh, against cyber risk attacks. And we want to have enforceable governments on, on this uh, network and strict boundaries. So we also want to, to be able to sanction um, parties on the network that don't behave. Maybe not, you know, just throw them out, but maybe give the user some tools to actually handle that, detect it and, and uh, um, you know, take measures. We want to extend the trust in the network. We want to know the parties which are on the network and providing services to the network, to them to be identifiable. And we also want to move away from this, uh, uh, you know, hub and spoke architecture that we had up until now. So flexible, any to any communication uh, system should become possible on the network. Of course, we could have rebuilt the network from scratch on existing technologies, but then if you touch it, why not doing something cool and fancy, right? Mm -hmm. Last but not least, and this is an important point here, um, as we know, networks are built on ecosystems uh, which run on business. If there's no business behind or if, if you change complete business models, then it doesn't work. And this was an important aspect to us as well. We didn't want to you know, disrupt the business models completely. So we wanted to give the ISPs and the participating parties a prospect on what they would deliver that they, it, it would actually be a, an, interesting, um, an interesting business model. Next slide. So on the left-hand side, you see what the, the network, you know, in essence is looking right now um, that we had for the last 20 years. It's, it's, it's working well. It's uh, just doing what it's supposed to do, except that it, it doesn't meet all those requirements that I was talking about. So the vision was to actually go to more into a community-based, any-to-any internet-like architecture that you see on the right-hand side. And in the middle of this network, you actually see depicted, you know, the idea of uh, having these ISPs all being able to offer their services. Out of which these ISPs three form a core of the uh, aforementioned ISD, so the isolation domain in the SIAN network. Next slide. So before we actually started, we reached out and looked at possibilities and uh, um, implementations from other you know, sources, other ideas. So there are a few, and you know probably about this since you're part of this uh, research group, there are a few proposals on how to redesign and re-architect the internet. None of which were really you know, up to industry grade so that we could make use of them. So we wanted to, we, we went through a comparison between these internet uh, architectures and uh, so wanted one, of course, that was available and also met the requirements. So as said, replacing the existing network with just another one of the same type could have been a, a viable solution. But then again, we know that ISPs, carriers, are actually moving away from these MPLS implementations because the industry is going in a different way. First of all, either they do SD1 or then they go to cloud altogether. SD1 we briefly discussed, but since we're a multi-party network of around 300 participants, there's uh, interoperability issues. So either you go for a single provider 
or you go for single implementation and neither of both is a viable option to a uh, community of that size. So we saw that Cyan actually delivered on this uh, promise so to, to meet the requirements and we knew that Cyan was already implemented in a number of areas you know, for private networks, so sort of proof of concept work was done. Um, for instance, the Swiss National Bank was an early adopter, the Swiss government did some tests on it. So, uh, and then furthermore, there was already some collaboration between us and ETH at where the, the uh, initial protocol set was developed and deployed. And uh, so we had a good basis to actually go for, a, a, let's say, a, a, an implementation in the wild. Next slide. So what is uh, different and is beneficial for us to actually build this SSFN and the, um, the network based on Scion? So what is really important, if you talk banks, then they want to see a controlled environment. They are not willing to just go out to the internet and then put their information, put their um, uh, transactions at risk. So they wanted to see something which was uh, a user-centric enforceable governance so that a community-based governance could be deployed or created, developed. And this should also be something local. So you should be able to enforce that locally without depending on a, let's say, geographically remote party or another uh, party from other industries. So the governance can actually be split from the actual operations, which is also important, you know, in a traditional, let's say, more uh, generic science network, most likely the core providers would also define the governance or at least loosely define the governance according to laws and regulations from, let's say, uh, government. But the governments here can really be split for, you know, to knowledgeable parties about the financial industry, in our case, like Swiss National Bank and SIX, and the core providers could still do their, their, their things, their business, right? So it's not, it doesn't need to be identical. The um, ISD concept allows for a complete isolation of trust. So we went for that. So we did not just create an ISD as separate uh, root of trust, but also created a complete separation from any other network. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is what we came up with as for the governance. And this slide is a bit overwhelming. You can check it afterwards in the slide deck that is being shared. On the left-hand side, you have these voting members. They say who can join, how, how is the uh, joining process, and how would it be actually if they were thrown off the network again? And this is actually uh, covered in what Sam referred to as this TRC, this trust truth con configuration which is digitally signed by all these parties and therefore uh, gives the users the, the trust in the network so that the parties they are talking to are actually those that they, they claim to be. And then on the right-hand side, middle right-hand side, there's the service providers, the ISPs, which need to adhere to certain rules and the SSFN users, so the actual banks or financial institutions. This is uh, a well-defined uh, structure on how they, they can actually join this network. So uh, next slide, please. In order to actually enforce the whole thing, you need to go through this TRC creation and maintenance. Um, Sam just talked about how to create an ISD and this is exactly what we have done. So the TRC creation, the life cycle is actually quite well documented and, and, uh, and established. There's also this uh, draft um, uh, RFC on the Cyan PKI where it talks about what you need to do and how you need to do it. And in practice, of course, this needs to then be adopted and signed to the real use case in uh, a multi-party ISD, which is, uh, should be probably, right? You, you don't probably want to trust an ISD that is just signed by one single party. So uh, trust is, is enlarged if there's multiple parties coming together and you know express the same uh, attitude, the same purpose of, of what should be done. It's a bit more um, difficult to actually come by with these ceremonies and, and everything. They have to be effective and viable. Also over time, it's not sufficient to just sign once. You need to re-sign every certain period of time. We decided to actually re-sign every, every year, so on a, on a yearly basis. 
So these are the elements that you need to come up with in order to create this ISD and then to, to formulate them in the TRC. So the ISD ID, some numbering authority needs to hand this out to you. This was in this case on Apaya, as we heard before. The purpose of the ISD, the core and authoritative participants, validity period, how long should it be valid um, before it needs to be renewed, the voting quorum, so how many parties actually need to be present in order to still um, valid, perform the, the uh, signing so that the ISD, uh, the TRC will be valid. Then certificates, the CA routes, so the actual uh, route certificate needs to be in there, and also the certificates that need to be created by each and individual party of these voting members. And then there's some other parameters which we will see in a minute. Next slide. So this is actually a <clears throat> screenshot of what we just did about two weeks ago or so when renewing the ISD, the SS7 ISD TRC. So you see these elements all, uh, probably you cannot read this from the far back, but uh, it's going to be in the slide deck. So you have this actual structure on the, the TRC that you combine. So this is the policy that you uh, agree upon and you express this agreement by actually signing this content. Next slide. So here's the, you know, the basic steps of the process. So you need to collect this material. You verify this, um, that it's really what every party is actually supposed to bring to the table, that it's really there and, and uh, accurate. And then you agree on the necessary required parameters, the ones that we indicated above. So everybody needs to give consent. You then generate the payload. So you combine these, um, the, this material to a structured container. You do the signing process, which each individual party is doing on their own. And then you combine these signatures and create the final TRC container. And then you disseminate out to the network. Next slide. So the first SSFN ISD has been created in, in November 2021, so roughly two years ago. And we have set the validity period to 395 days in order to create some overlap and not to run into the festive season. Um, and so we renewed successfully in 2022 and 2023. We could, of course, have extended that period of signing. So we could have made it, let's say, five years valid or something. You can do that. But then after five years, you all need to retrieve the material. You need to access the keys. You need to access, you know, make sure that the parties have not lost their knowledge or the people or everything of it. So it's a bit of operational um, caution that you need to uh, exercise there. And then the dissemination into the assets of NISD. So actually it will become valid as of November 15th, so in nine days. Um, this is actually seamless and goes without any any interruption this is also something that we learned out of operating this network very stable we haven't had a glitch since then since we uh, created it and it proved to be very very reliable next slide so how could actually ietf irtf help here we see that there is a lack of adoption in order to actually continue the work and to see you know, more ISDs coming up, we know that it's, it's just limited. You know, it's a, what we did is a lighthouse implementation. We just demonstrated how it could work and that it could work. But we need to see <clears throat> more bigger companies, uh, network software companies picking up that lead and implementing the science software. And the ISPs need to come along and then pick up the uh, adoption and, and create some services. We need some operational authorities for numbering. We need some global governance. Um, this is partially addressed by the science association, but it could be, of course, uh, there could be more to it. So the lack of standardization could be addressed at IETF and there will be more work needed, such as uh, continuing the work on the internet uh, drafts towards LFCs and aligning with other work and probably there's going to be some more options, of course, also in research. Next slide. So this is it. Uh, here you find a, a list of resources that you can go to if you want to find out more about SSFN. I'm also going to be here, here for mostly uh, the rest of the week. So 
if you want to approach me and talk to me, please feel free. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, special thanks for coming up, apologizing for your super businessy um, presentation and then giving us screenshots of a command line interface. Well done. <laughs> I feel a little trolled, but it's... <laughs> Uh, so I think given where we are in time, uh, I'd like to come back up to s start framing the, um, the discussion period. Did you want to come up and do that, Nicola? Should I do it from the, I mean, your slides <laughs> and then we'll do, um, we'll like do like any questions in the queue as part of the open discussion. Yep. Yeah, all right. Well, I think uh, the other speaker has already mentioned. Um, just to summarize, I think with Cyan we have some uh, concrete deployment experience, and uh, I was happy that today we could uh, also showcase um, the current productive deployments. We have uh, two main implementations, one proprietary from Anapaya, one open source. Uh, there is even a proprietary PKI, which... Uh, uh, we haven't really uh, talked about, and there is a growing Scion community. And uh, so we believe that Scion can fill in gaps in uh, several areas where uh, where I think more work is needed, especially when it comes to uh, routing security, to inter-domain path-aware networking. Uh, now there is also this uh, concept of trust enhanced networking. So I believe that this is something that we could really contribute to uh, the IRTF, IETF community. And so moving on to the next slide, as uh, we mentioned earlier, we already have a set, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we have already a set of the core science components uh, described. So this is really a specification. You'll find uh, uh, the packet header structures and so on. There is still a little bit of work needed on those drafts, but I think this is a good starting point to really document the existing deployment and really how it works. Then we have other more descriptive drafts like the Cyan overview, the component analysis. And if you move on to the next slide, then this opens up the question to uh, how do we find a suitable space within uh, IRTF, IETF for this work. And so based on discussions we have had with people and at the previous uh, meetings, I think we believe that some of the work, some of the more specification work that documents existing deployments as they are today. I think this could be a, a great fit perhaps for an independent submission. Uh, but I think there's also many areas of science where I think more uh, research, more interoper interoperability is needed. And so this is something that might fit uh, better in, in a research group. And I think this yeah, just opens up to the discussion where I think we would be happy to come out of this discussion with a clear idea of where um, where this work is going. Yeah, I think I'm actually gonna leave this slide up. Uh, so I'd say what, I'd like to have like a big open discussion. We have 32 minutes. I think that, do we have, yeah, the clock is up so we can watch the clock tick down. Um, so any questions, clarifying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where I do wanna get toward the end of this with my research group chair hat on is, do we believe there is research that we would like to do on this within PanRG? I don't know that we're gonna get all the way to asking that question formally here, but that's where I'm trying to get. So uh, Lan Ching, um, coming up, I'm sorry I cut you off last time. The queue is now open. Should we get the other speakers as well, or how do you want to? Uh, we didn't have Q&A for- uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah, so like if you're, if you're addressed, come on up. <laughs> Oh yeah, just coming up. Yeah, Lan Cheng from Tsinghua University. Yes, uh, in the discipline of sign architecture, to my understanding, the MAC of a package will be checked by routers during forwarding. So have you measured the data plan forwarding performance before and after your deployment? Mm, I mean, if I want to be a sign AS, and install sign routers, will the data plan forwarding be compromised? And how can I do to mitigate that influence? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So first of all, I think if you as an AES adopt sign, you will be for a long time um, 
an IP and sign um, provider. And everything that is not sign, you will handle with your existing infrastructure and there should be no impact at all, right? Now, in terms of forwarding performance uh, of sign um, routers, so as I, as I mentioned before, we run this on commodity server grade hardware, right? Um, and the most expensive operation is actually an AES computation to verify this MAC. Um, we see in our implementation, which is uh, which builds on top of DPDK, we can get to numbers as 10 million packets per second per core. And now if you have sufficient, many, uh, sufficient flows, you can actually distribute them across um, different cores. So you can reach 100 plus gigs per second on a relatively modest uh, server. So from that point of view, of course, if we talk about moving the entire video of the internet onto sign, might not be feasible right now. Um, but at least for the use cases we see today, which is which are not very um, bandwidth heavy, um, it's plenty. Okay, thank you. Doug. I thought I noticed that uh, you say that the Scion IDs are disjoint from current um, ASNs. I wonder if you could comment on what overlap the Scion trust infrastructure might have with RPKI, which is you know, currently achieving some level of wide scale adoption. Could a Scion trust anchor be a delegated CA out of RPKI? Um, that's a very good question. Um, also in, in that respect, the, the Scion trust anchor is, is completely separate from, from RPKI. Um, and the trust anchors are defined in this uh, trust rule configuration that also Fritz um, mentioned in his uh, presentation. <laughs> now, could that be a delegated CA from uh, rooted in RPKI? Why not? Let, let's discuss that. I want to say that there is definitely some um, interoperability concern, or let, let's say where RPKI plays a role is when we talk about IP and sign towning, right? There is, of course, this mapping between oh, this destination IP network belongs to this sign AS, and we want to use actually RPKI to prove that you're the owner of that IP space and sign that also with... Um, the sign AS certificate that proves, yeah, I'm I'm this sign um, entity, right? And and so there, definitely the combination of RPKI and the sign trust uh, hierarchy uh, comes together in this IP and sign tunneling. If we talk about IP um, sign native communication, then RPKI technically is not necessary. Hi, uh, Brian Trammell, as an individual uh, asking a question that Brian Trammell as a chair would be very annoyed with. Um, <laughs> naming question mark. Uh, I noticed you got through an entire presentation about how Scion works without talking about like how people actually get to the path components from a naming situation, the existing Scion internet. Could you spend less than 30 seconds answering that question, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, less than 30 seconds it's very hard yes we have not talked about uh, naming at all or resolving sign addresses um the current so if in ip and sign tunneling right it doesn't matter right yeah, you, you just go DNS. to the gateway and everything works yes. um okay that's that's why it's not okay that makes sense exactly in in, in sign native you yourself have been working on a, a, a proposal for how to do name resolution in sign um, and an intermediate step, what we envision is actually, um, ex well, using TXT records in DNS that could supply for a given name also assign ISDAS tuple, right? Um, and for endpoints that understand this TXT-based extension, they could then use that as uh, assigned destination address. So, so that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense. Um, the main reason I'm asking that question is I've bumped into random. DNS people this week um, who are thinking about sort of DNS stuff that is kind of aligned with some of the work that I know has been done in NetSec around Scion addressing. So it might be interesting for you all to bump into some DNS people while you're here this week. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, I guess I'm up next. Uh, Rod Van Meter, KU University. Um, so I have a zillion questions, so I'm going to try to restrict them to just a couple of the uh, 
urgent ones. Um, first off, so the the, uh, the first presentation in, in the session was actually about uh, reducing energy consumption in uh, networking, but you're talking about an awful lot of signing and and signature verification operations here. So even in light of your 10 million packets per core, how are we doing on energy efficiency with this? Um, that's actually a very good question. So the signing um, and signature verification aspect, that is control plane only, and you don't do that per packet, right? You do that on a path lookup. When, you, when, you look, when I look up um, a set of paths to my destination, I maybe get a dozen, and then I verify these path segments, and that's a couple of uh, signature verifications, of course, but then I use those 10 paths for six hours, let's say. So that really get, gets amortized. Um, okay, so maybe I don't understand actually what happens on each packet forwarding operation. So, on e so there's a difference between um, uh, digital signatures being used on the control plane that mm -hmm. sign a path segment. Each individual AS on a path signs its entry on that path with its own um, certificate, private key and uh, um, corresponding uh, certificate can be used to verify that, right? In that you have this hop field information that is actually the thing that gets put onto the data plane. And in that hop field, you have a message authentication code that is only used by that AS to verify um, the packet then on the data plane. But that is using um, symmetric cryptography because it does not need mm -hmm. to be shared with anybody. So what you do is then uh, you use AS to verify that MAC on a data plane. And that's okay. what I um, mentioned in my presentation. That becomes the most expensive step on sign forwarding. We don't have routing tables per se anymore, right? Because it's encoded in the header, but we do need to verify that the header entry is correct and not forged. And that is mm -hmm. done with symmetric cryptography. And all the asymmetric cryptography is, is just on the control plane. Now to energy efficiency, there is actually a paper uh, by the research group at, at ETH uh, that tried to model and analyze um, and compare energy consumption of a sign router with um, uh, an IP. Mm -hmm. Router and well, of course, it makes some assumptions about um, energy cons consumption of TCAM and energy consumption of CPUs and whatnot. Um, and the outcome was that sign can be on a per packet basis more energy efficient because AS is cheaper than um, longest prefix match. Hmm. Okay. Um, if uh, I mean, yeah. Given this is a theoretical result, of course, the practice you know remains to be seen. Okay. Um, can I go? Can I go one more? Sure. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, one of the key points in, what, in the overall Cyan effort is, is really uh, security, right? But you didn't talk about a lot about how Cyan fits with other security mechanisms at, at well, we mentioned naming a minute ago, but, but also you know, TLS or application level things, as well as physical layer security, where you might be looking at, I don't know, um, uh -huh. you know, loss or, or, or power transmission in the fiber or something to detect uh, physical tapping of fibers and things like that. How do, how do they fit together? No, actually, I, thank you for that question. Um, I think it's a, it's a very good question. So when we, when we mean security, we're talking mostly about two things. A, routing security, right? Um, the whole traffic hijacking is prevented by science through this um, signing of path segments and the chaining of max that you cannot alter paths anymore. Um, so um, the routing security aspect is definitely one aspect of security that signs also. That was also, by the way, our initial research question. We, we, we asked ourselves, how, what can we do uh, to create an interdomain secure routing protocol given a greenfield approach? Now that's a little bit of history, um, but out of it came sign. The other part of security is really where, where sign focus on is, is the availability aspect, right? Um, because security, usually you talk about it as a triangle, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, CI and A. Um, and confidentiality and integrity, of course, you get through encryption and authentication. That's, let's say, kind of a solved problem, but then availability is usually quite hard to, to achieve. Um, and, and sign tries with its path-based um, network um, where paths are individually secured, of course, uh, to provide this guaranteed availability um, on the network level, granted with some extensions on top of sign that you would still need to, to get that in all circumstances, right? But even the base sign, as is described in the drafts, today with the traffic hijacking prevention, the immediate 
path failover into the main path failure can give you a lot of availability guarantees and the control who gets my path information, who can even talk to me on a network level, gives you a lot of availability benefits. And when we talk about security, then we mean A, routing security, and B, availability aspects of security. Not encryption and not authentication of, of payload. All right, thanks. Tim. Hi, uh, Tim Chang. First, I'd like to take 10 seconds to say there is fantastic free coffee just the other side of that screen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is no queue right now, so thank you to the baristas. Um, <laughs> to, to, well, first of all, I think this is, as Jordan earlier said, this is cool. I, I like a lot of the ideas here. I see how you're attracted by you know, things like having the, the local governance and trust and so on. That, that's really nice. Two questions. First one is, what have you learned in terms of the deployability and adoption of other overlay protocols? And LISP comes to mind as one that has maybe some of the similar challenges to you. Uh, and the second one is, I'll come back to the question about MTU that was asked earlier. If I want to be running a standard 1500 MTU in my LAN, what sort of overhead do I need in the backbone and end-to-end uh, -to, -end to actually fit all the things I've seen you present here in? You want to take the first? <laughs> um, when it comes to uh, learning from existing protocols, um, I, I think I would love to have more conversations with the uh, Lisp folks. I think one area where uh, I think there can be some, some interesting ideas is when it comes to uh, mapping one, uh, one domain, let me call it domain, let's say the, uh, you know, in this, they have this uh, routing locators and identifiers. And if you look at the idea, I think we do the same because Scion does routing based on this ISD AS tuple. And then the end host address is, let's say, left outside of, well, it is carried by the Scion uh, bucket header, but it's, uh, that's not what determines routing. So you have the same idea of routing locator and uh, end host identifier. And I think we, uh, it, it would be interesting in the long term to see how the mapping uh, happens uh, between the two of them when it comes to wide, uh, widespread interoperability. And I think this is what we have the gateway for, which I think is a bit of a quick um, solution to make it work and get some workloads on it. But I think if you want to look in the long term and uh, think about protocol evolution in long term. I think this is an area where potentially I think there could be synergies with, with what, what uh, Lisp is doing. But I'm, I don't know Lisp that well, so. It's just an uh, example. Yeah, it's a, good example. it's a good example, yes. So I agree with you, but we, it's, it's, it's future work. And on the other question, let me get Sam. Um, so if I understand your other question correctly, you're interested in, let's say, uh, an average overhead per sign packet, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so from, practice if we assume roughly you know an internet path is i think on average four as hops roughly right yeah. if you assume that would hold true in sign as well or maybe it's five because we expect there be um uh, be more as's actually in a full deployment um plus the additional ip underlay that you still need right right now sign is never directly on the layer two but it uses this ip underlay um, we are talking roughly about 100 to 120 bytes per packet. Of course, if you have a 10 hop path, then this can go up to uh, you know, 180, 200 bytes. If you have a two hop path, then it's lower. But on average, we expect roughly 80 to 100 bytes of overhead. Right. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, Ron, best KIT. Um, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I like the idea that the, the end system can actually choose the path, right? But on the other hand, ISPs probably don't like it so much because they have, let's say, restricted or constraints uh, ways of doing traffic engineering. So I, I don't know. I mean, maybe you have discussed that earlier and I missed that, but, but I think there is some kind of tension between letting the, the, let's say, the end system select which path to take and having still the providers means of doing some kind of load balancing, whatever. I mean, inside their own AS, that's for sure, but I mean, more on a global scale. Um, yes, that's a question that comes up. Um, I think every time we talk to an ISP, 
for sure. And the, you're right, there is this tension. Um, what I have to say about this is that don't think of sign as um, source routing, where the source can actually choose any path there might be through the network, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a sender actually gets a selection of paths that are, let's say, policy compliant. That is clear. That is okay. clear. <laughs> so, but in that path um, creation, or during path creation or path discovery, the ISP also have, has a say of, okay, I want to, uh, to allow this hop from this ingress to this egress yeah, sure. for this downstream customer. Or I, not, I right? know the, the, the policies are clear, but I mean, it's what I meant is, is more of the dynamic situation. So if, if, if uh, some ISP sees that, that it's probably the, say the, the link to, to one AS is more congested and just, they want to shift the traffic to to another AS, then it's yes. not possible. Or do we have policies mm -hmm. that are pushed to the, let's say, to the end systems? I mean, Shim Six had a very similar problem, right? Um, I mean, what today happens is uh, most senders in today's sign network are actually sign IP gateways, and they have a pretty good map uh, or pretty good information about the performance characteristics, including drop rate um, and latency and chitter of each path, right? Now, if a link gets congested, that will lead to, to uh, either increased chitter latency or drop rates, and then you would move away. Um, and it's also not entirely deterministic how they move away from that path so that not everybody chooses the same different path, right? But you're relying on the network edge um, to do the right thing in a way. Now, if everybody is well, or if, a majority of endpoints are well behaved. You can actually show that um, the utilization of the network can go up over a purely um, in-network uh, traffic engineering or steering. Um, but you know, let's say the proof is still out whether this, at very large scale, would is actually what would happen. Um, you can definitely shift away traffic from uh, a given interface or a given link by revoking that interface. Although that is a bit of a nuclear option because revoking means I will not let any more traffic through that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as a final comment, there is there are metadata, um, that arbitrary metadata that you can attach to sign paths, right? Um, we use that, for example, to communicate uh, MTUs or um, geographical locations of routers. Uh, in the future, it could be a price tag or there could also be a low tag because these paths are relatively frequently refreshed and you could include a load indicator in, uh, in that that would also be a signal for end nodes um, on the load of that link. But these are extensions that I think, you know, can be discussed here, whether they make sense or not, uh, future will tell. Rod Van Meter, KU University. So related question actually uh, on, on that topic. Um, earlier you were talking about, uh, one of you all was talking about the, outages and detection of that in, in this. Do you have a, uh, a target for, for the responsiveness of this system to, to, to uh, topology changes as well as traffic changes? Um, yes, so what happens today is um, there is this um, sign control message protocol, which is the equivalent to ICMP basically. And if, for example, a link um, experiences a, a disruption, then the associated router would send an SMP message back to the sender, to the source of the packet saying, hey, this link is down or this link is revoked or whatever, there's, there's some problem. So the current expectation or the current implementation and deployment actually has a, a sub RTT failover um, latency, right? It depends on how far on the path the, the incident happens and, and the packet making it uh, back to you and then you switch. So um, within Europe, Right now, we see packet switching or path switching latencies of sub 10 milliseconds. Now, to Australia, this will be a bit different. Um, but that's, that's the level of interdomain failover that you can expect. OK, that's, that's actually really interesting. That's actually even shorter than I expected. How, do, how does it scale with the number of uh, connections that are actually potentially passing through that? Would you need to, 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 to uh, reject and have and have um, uh, 
recalculation for for every separate connection that's being proposed? Through, through so the recalculation doesn't really happen because uh, the thing is, you know, I I already know from the data plane, let's say, ten different paths to my destination, and now one of them actually gets revoked, so I don't need to recalculate anything. I can just basically switch to something that I already know. Of course, if I don't know any other path, I need to look. I do need to do a path lookup again, and if there is actually no other path available, then there might be a, a new um, round of beaconing that's necessary if there is another path. Um, but in general, you can use your available information. And, and I think that's what makes sign actually super mm -hmm. resilient because you don't need to wait for the network to somehow reconverge. You have these pre-calculated paths um, and you can make use of them for as long as, as they live. And you get pretty instant feedback for each one of them. But from, from the router's point of view, when that when that when that router develops a problem, if it's got a hundred thousand connections going through it, yes. you're now going to have a hundred thousand SNMP messages and a hundred thousand connections are individually going to have to recalculate for select another path. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So Elliot, you had said that you wanted to come up and have a little bit of a talk. I'm guessing as the ISE. <laughs> yeah. And, um... I'd like to invite Eric and Colin, if, if Colin's still here, I don't know if he's still there. Um, who's out there, Colin? To, to comment too. Um, you'll see on the slide, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Elliot Lear, I'm the independent submissions editor. Um, you'll see on the slide there that the independent submissions editor is named. Um, but uh, before we talk about independent submissions, uh, the key thing that I think is important for this group and for the authors is sort of to determine the best way forward for the work to proceed. I counted my own self about a dozen research questions that I could come up with, and I'm not even in this research group normally. <laughs> okay, and uh, I think Rodney here uh, actually, you know, he's got a lengthy list that, that, that he wants to tackle. Um, there, yeah, there's, um, but well, so the, um, there are many ways that this can work. Um, this group could decide to take on these documents. The authors could decide to send them to me. You could go along the path that HTTP went, for instance, where you had implementation drafts, you just started with an implementation draft and you updated the drafts periodically as implementation drafts until you got to the point where you felt you had something that Eric might want to have presented in the int area that might take years, I don't know. These are different paths you can take and let me now sit down and, and maybe ask the others to talk. Eric, you got named first, I think, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But basically, so Eric Ring this time has a responsibility for Interaya, where you can get uh, um, ITS stream documents and, and really standards somehow. Um, I think it's a bit too early to go there. Uh, we discussed over email the last IATF, I think. So, but that's the path to go. Uh, I mean, if, if there is huge interest at some point of time in this, and it looks like it's, it's becoming stable, yes, we will meet again at that point of time. Okay. But I think now, like, uh, oh, you're there. Uh, it, it's a little bit researchy, right, right now. This is interesting. Yeah, hi, uh, Colin Perkins, uh, IATF chair. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think I agree with what Eric and uh, uh, Elliot have just said. Um, I, I can certainly see a bunch of interesting research questions here. Um, mm. I can... Um, also see that uh, you know, this is something which will eventually benefit from standards and standardization. Um, whether it's quite there yet, uh, maybe not, but I don't think it's so far away. It's, and it's going in the right direction. Um, you know, the approach you suggest on the slide um, is certainly one way of moving forward. You know, doc document what we have now um, by our independent submissions, do some research here, and then maybe uh, after things have evolved a bit, take it to the IETF and, and the internet area. That, that's certainly a way forward. Um, with some effort, I'm sure you can think of other ways of uh, progressing the work. Um, 
I think uh, you know, spend a bit of time thinking about what you need. You know, is is this you know is this something where where we can best provide benefits by doing the work in a research group? Is it can we best provide benefits by publishing the current drafts maybe on the independent stream? Can we best provide benefit by letting the things evolve for a while and then potentially uh, just going straight into the standards group? Yeah, um, may I um, respond? Yeah, um, yeah th th thanks to all three of you for your input. Um, responding to Colin, um, I think what what is important for us is twofold. So I think on one side, we want to document what is deployed um, today because there is some, uh, albeit limited, there is some uh, production deployment and so on. Uh, so I think this has to be documented somewhere. And uh, I think doing this process will, uh, will also help us to see some of the limitations. On the other hand, I think we have a lot of open research questions on areas that are not necessarily tied to the core of science, but more to, for example, interoperability, um, transition mechanisms, uh, we mentioned naming. I mean, there's many areas, and this is, I think, a, a lot of work where uh, we don't have answers. We don't know if if we should come up with some new ideas, if we should really try to change some parts of science to reuse existing protocols. I think in some areas there is this possibility. So uh, I think we could perhaps uh, pursue both avenues in parallel, where I think for what concerns uh, specifications, and I think especially for the PKI and the control plane that are quite well defined, uh, deployed, and so on. Maybe even for the data plane, I think it would be a um, a good fit to go via an independent submission to take a snapshot at what is there. I think in parallel we want to be keep keeping involved in uh, in an RG uh, to continue discussing on, on on these questions. And I mean today we saw gateways, interoperability, and so on. So on this, I think we could ask to Panerji if there is some interest. Um, yeah, and I think this too could be in parallel. So uh, I would just comment as the ice, right? If we do publish this, I think I'd want to put some notes on it and say, hey, this is early. And also you have the option, even as it's published, to keep an implementation draft or a set of implementation drafts where you can make changes. I think my, my key message to you is that the work is very early and you're going to want to change all of those drafts in some ways as you're going forward. So we find a way to have that option open to you. And I think that would be good if like, if that happened here, actually, if this group wants to take it. I mean, uh, can, can, I, can I respond to that? I uh, mean, you can override me. You're the IRTF chair, absolutely. but <laughs> um, so I think the question uh, that, that Elliot asked is, could we initially adopt the three drafts that are here? as implementation drafts within PanRG as a worked example of the 9217 questions. Just to be careful, right? I'm okay publishing them as, as independent yeah. submissions, but also having them adopted here ah, okay. in, in order to allow the work to evolve. Is Got that it. something that you would want to entertain in this room? I'm asking. Um, I would certainly be open to that with my chair hat on. I think that like, again, we have sort of like our charter and then our set of questions and we have, a bunch of of evolving answers to those questions um, uh, presented by this iron architecture that that makes sense to me, um, and I think that sort of like having that discussion here, as we get you know either like I think Rod you said earlier um, I'm not sure those are research questions that was just me not understanding it I'm not sure that's not the same thing <laughs> honestly like if you put people who are who are very well versed in sort of the spaces and it's like okay i don't get how this works um that's not necessarily not a research question yeah that's good <laughs> but i'm asking those questions because i'm buying right. yeah. <laughs> i'm also not sure that's the case but we can have that discussion over a beverage of your choice like the excellent coffee right behind that wall um so i this happened okay Colin, come rescue me. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, th this seems like a perfectly reasonable way yeah. forward. Yeah. Um, I would um, maybe say that some of this is going to get close to the IETF work. 
And yep. Maybe going to need some close cooperation with some of the AETF groups. Uh, Sorry, Eric, you're not off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, a, a lot of this, I mean, yes, there's research questions here, yeah. but to make it work at scale, which is what you need, you're going to have to have some, some nice interactions with the people yeah. actually building products and operational, you know, significant operational experience. And I think that we can start having that discussion here, right? Like one of the, one of our research questions is explicitly, how do you operate networks like this? Because it's a totally different operation model. Yeah. And, and it was for sure on the hook, not only me as an int, but also <laughs> my colleagues in routing and security. That's right. Because the beauty yep. of the ATF, you can get multiple yep. feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we have been inter in, interacting with, with several communities. One of the challenges is that Scion is quite cross domain because, you know, it's PKI, control plane, data plane. That's why um, it was a bit of a, a struggle for us. Um, Right. So we've got like 21 seconds. I'm not going to take a hum. Um, I think uh, what we will do as chairs is take this proposal as we understand it, phrase it, take it to the mailing list and have the discussion there. And I don't know how many people are planning on going to Brisbane, um, but we can talk about <laughs> schedule. I mean, like you'll be there, obviously, um, but we can talk about scheduling uh, subsequent meetings with more Scion content. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you for the Scion show and we will see you at the next one of these wherever it happens to be. Yeah, it works. I was told there was coffee. <laughs> uh, I think it was a trap. <laughs> I'm not sure it was a hidden agenda in this thing. <laughs>